Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on fungus. Um, so fungus is uh, another one of the major kingdoms in, uh, in the eukaryota, uh, the domain of the eukaryota. Um, there is a lot of diversity. There's about 1.5 million fungal species. They are rather difficult to identify because oftentimes they uh, look very different from each other when they're growing on different substrates. It could be the exact same species and growing on two different substrates. It looks very different. Um, they're very diverse. They're everything from single cellular to very multicellular organisms. Um, but they are all, uh, they are all chemoheterotrophs. So remember a chemoheterotroph is something that um, it has to get its energy from chemical bonds and it gets those chemicals, in this case carbon-based molecules, from, from other organisms. So they have to eat other things, okay? So they tend to um, extract and absorb the nutrients from their surroundings. They do what we call um, external digestion. So we'll take a look at that in just a second. Um, they are actually very closely related to the animals. Um, we share, animals share a common ancestor with fungus about 460 million years ago. Um, so there are a lot of similarities between animals and fungus, although you might not think so. Um, so generally, if you're looking at a fungus, um, if you're looking at a multicellular fungus in particular, they tend to consist of very long, slender strands called hyphae. Um, and those hyphae are usually multicellular, so they usually have divide cellular division along the length of that strand. Um, some are more continuous where cytoplasm is more free to flow but along the strand. Others are divided, and even the divided ones, though, have what, these little holes uh, called uh, pores in their septa, which are the dividers, and that allows cytoplasm to flow back and forth up and down the hyphae, which allows for really, really rapid growth of these fungus. So if you've ever noticed like the day after it rains, all of a sudden there are mushrooms popping up everywhere, it's that ability to have um, cytoplasm move between cells that allows that really rapid growth, okay? Um, now these hyphae are usually uh, organized into mats, which we call mycelia. So they're a mass of interconnected hyphae. Um, these can be, they can cover acres. There can be acres underneath the soil there are acres of these mycelium uh, interconnected strands of hyphae from a single individual fungus that are growing through the soil substrate. Um, and they'll grow through and digest any organic material that is in that substrate. Uh, the fungal cell walls um, contain chitin. Chitin is the same um, protein that's found in the exoskeletons of arthropods, and that's what gives them their structure is that cell wall with chitin. Okay. Um, most fungus uh, are reproduced by the use of spores. Um, spores can be produced either through sexual or asexual reproduction, um, and most of them are dispersed by the wind, so these fungal spores get up into the air, there's lots of them floating around all the time, and then they'll settle into different places, and if the habitat is favorable, then a new fungus can grow there, okay? Um, so looking at the fungal life cycle, as I said, they can re reproduce asexually or sexually. When they're reproducing sexually, generally, or asexually rather, generally you have your mycelium, they'll shoot up some sort of fruiting body, that's what we usually call the reproductive structure. They'll release spores that are identical to the parent, those spores will float around the wind, they'll land, they'll germinate, they'll grow more hyphae, grow new mycelia, produce spores. And so there's no mating going on there, it's just, a, it's just asexual reproduction. Okay, so some fungus reproduce sexually. Um, generally, fungus are haploid. So you have these two haploid individuals that uh, have mats of these um, uh, hyphae, the mycelium, that are growing through the substrate. And two of those hyphae will come together and they'll touch and they'll fuse and they'll form a single cell. And that, that single cell will actually maintain the nuclei from the two individuals. And so now you have a cell with two nuclei. That's called a heterokaryotic cell. Uh, remember, we have things like eukaryotic and prokaryotic. Prokaryotic means before the nucleus. Eukaryotic means new nucleus. Heterokaryotic means different nucleus. So you have a cell with two different nuclei. Um, that cell can then divide for a while with its two nuclei. So you have a heterokaryotic organism for a little while. Eventually, those uh, two nuclei will fuse together. Once they fuse, then you're talking about a diploid individual because you now have two copies of each chromosome. And then um, that diploid individual will go through meiosis and produce spores, and then those spores will distribute and germinate into new haploid individuals. So it's kind of a weird life cycle, okay? Um, fungus, all fungus are, are chemoheterotrophs. 
So they, um, they uh, get their energy by breaking down compounds, breaking down chemical bonds, um, and they need to get their carbon-based molecules from another source. So most of the time what they do is they secrete digestive enzymes into their environment, they break down organic compounds that are in their environment, and then they absorb those through the walls of their, uh, their cells. So it's kind of like if you wanted to eat a sandwich and you put your hand on the sandwich, and you, di you excreted some enzymes that digested that sandwich, and then you absorbed the sandwich through your hand. That's kind of, that's how fungi eat. So it's kind of cool. Um, most of them are decomposers, so they can actually uh, break down um, cellulose in plant material, which is very hard to break down. We can't break down cellulose. And they can break down lignin in wood, which is what makes wood woody. Um, and so they're actually able to, they're one of the few organisms that can break down wood tissue and cause it to rot, which is why you don't want fungus in your house, because they'll eat your house, because that, that's what they're doing. They're breaking it down, they're digesting it, and they're eating it. So you do not want fungus eating your house. Um, a few of them are actually carnivorous, which is kind of cool. They actually will hunt and capture uh, tiny animals like roundworms that are crawling through the soil. And the roundworms actually try to escape these, these uh, carnivorous fungus. So roundworms, they kind of, they move by wiggling. And so the roundworm will be wiggling towards something and it'll come in contact with a fungus and it'll go, oh, that's a fungus, and it'll wiggle backwards and try and get away. But if the fungus, if it wiggles too far into the fungus, the fungus will actually wrap around that roundworm and capture it and then digest it from the outside in because it's going to excrete those digestive enzymes and break that little roundworm down and eat it. So it's kind of cool stuff. Um, fungi are really, really important in ecology. Um, they are one of the most important decomposers. They break down organic material and make it available for other organisms. Um, so particularly things like cellulose and lignin from wood. Uh, woody material really wouldn't get break, broken down very well uh, without the presence of fungus. If you imagine a forest and it's all covered with all those little sticks and branches and things, fungi are going to be what breaks that down and releases those compounds back into the environment so that other plants can make use of them. Um, so they're a really, really important decomposer. Um, as we talked about when we were talking about plants, they also are, a lot of them have symbiotic relationships with plants. So these are called mycorrhizae. And they will grow around the roots of the plant. Um, they are fed by the plant. The plant will give them sugars to feed upon. And then the, the mycorrhizae will increase the surface area of those roots and allow the plant to absorb more water and more nutrients from the soil than they would be able to otherwise. So both the plant benefits and the fungus benefits. And many plants don't grow well without their mycorrhizae um, friends. There are also fungi who have symbiotic relationships with uh, some sort of photosynthetic partner, usually either a cyanobacteria or an algae. Um, these are what we call lichens. So you can remember Freddy Fungus and Alice Algae took a lichen to each other and their relationship has been on the rocks ever since. Really bad jokes, we like them. Okay, so lichens um, are really important for uh, breaking down rock. They're actually one of the few things that weather and break down rocks into smaller components. Um, so you'll often see them growing on rocks or growing on trees. Um, and uh, again, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. The algae has a nice home to live in. The fungus protects the algae. And then the algae is photosynthetic, so it's making sugars, and then it feeds the fungus. Um, so this allows the, the lichen to live in places where really nothing else could grow, like on the sheer face of a rock, on the bark of a tree, things like that. So they're very tolerant to very extreme environments where other things couldn't grow. Some fungi, however, are harmful. So some are beneficial, some have important ecological roles, and some are harmful to humans. Um, there are fungus that infect food. So um, a couple examples of that are um, ergot. Ergot is a fungus that infects the heads of grains, so like wheat and rye. Um, and it produces a bunch of uh, compounds that um, cause seizures and tremors and mania and kind of um, hysteria in, in people. Um, so it, it changes the, they're psychoactive, so it changes the, the, uh, the brain chemistry, causes hallucinations, and it also causes these um, uh, contractions and tremors within the body. Um, they actually think now that the uh, outbreak of bewitchment that occurred um, in the Salem witch trials 
was actually probably ergot poisoning from uh, grain that were was being harvested in that town. It led to the deaths of many people. Um, another uh, plant toxin is uh, aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is one of the carcin most carcinogenic compounds known to man, and it's produced by a fungus that grows on peanut shells. And so it's present in very tiny amounts in, um, in peanut butter. <laughs> so it's one, one, peanut butter has one of the most carcinogenic chemicals known to man. There's really no way to get around it. Um, so my, my uh, genetics professor always used to tell me, you know, the worst thing you can do if you uh, don't want to get cancer is uh, eat peanut butter s sandwiches in the sun, um, which is basically what I've spent my entire life doing. So there you go. Um, there are also disease-causing fungus, so you've probably heard of some of these, like athlete's foot and ringworm, yeast infections, nail fungus. Um, a lot of these diseases can be very, very difficult to treat. Um, and if you think about it, um, if you think of a phylogenetic tree of all of the organisms on the planet, our sister group as animals is actually the fungus. So things that kill fungus usually kill animals too. So it's hard to find treatments that are going to effectively kill the fungus without being toxic to humans. So that's why they're very, very difficult to, tr to treat. So here's, a, here's that phylogenetic tree again. Um, there you can see that animals are the sister group to the fungi. Um, and then there's a, a four, five major groups of fungi. Um, I'm not going to tell you much about the glo uh, glomeromycetes because uh, they're kind of a weird group and there's not very many of them. So I'm just going to tell you about the, the four most common groups of fungus. Um, so we're going to start with the chytrid funguses. Most of them are aquatic, many are unicellular, and most of them are um, decomposers. Um, but there are some that are pathogenic and actually chytrid fungus is causing a conservation uh, crisis in frog populations. There is a chytrid fungus that is infecting frogs, particularly in the tropics. It's probably already caused several extinctions of frogs because it's killed all of the frogs of a few species. And they're very, very concerned about many other frog species. Um, so they've actually been going out before the fungus infects a particular environment and trying to gather up all the frogs they can from that area and bring them into captivity so that if the fungus passes through and wipes out these populations, they still have a few of these frogs left in captivity. So right now it's a really hot topic in amphibian conservation. Um, the zygomycota uh, is a very, very diverse group. It's not monophyletic, it's probably a paraphyletic group. Um, it's still under a lot of research, but it contains a few things that you might be familiar with, like the bread mold. I'm sure you've seen mold on a bread. Um, those, are the, those are in the zygomycota. There's also a few human pathogens. Um, one note about bread mold, by the time you actually see uh, the growth of bread mold on the surface of your bread, and that little bit of spores being produced there, at that point, when there's spores being produced, there are hyphae from that fungus all throughout the entire bread loaf. So you can't just pick off that little bit and throw it away because you're just picking off the part that's reproductive and there's still going to be a whole bunch of, of bread mold hyphae throughout the bread. Um, bread mold's not that dangerous. You'd probably be fine if you ate it anyway, but it still kind of creeps me out at least. Uh, the bisidiomycota is probably the most well-known of the funguses. These are your typical mushrooms and also toadstools and shelf fungus and things like that. So <clears throat> um, the mushroom, if you go to the grocery store and you buy a mushroom, you're buying a basidiomycota. And the mushroom itself is actually the reproductive structure. So underneath the soil, there are the mats of hyphae, right? The, these, these mycelium that come together and they touch. And when they touch and they form that heterokaryotic structure, that, that grows up into the mushroom. So that's the reproductive structure is the actual mushroom. And then that mushroom produces the spores that then will spread the thing. So you're, when you eat a mushroom, you're basically eating the reproductive structure of a fungus. Okay. Um, and then the last group I want to talk about is the Ascomycota. This contains about 75% of all known fungi. It's an extremely diverse group. There's a whole bunch of different things in there, including um, some things that you might consider a mushroom, like morels. Um, it's not the same as the mushrooms in the Basidiomycota. And if you look at them, they have a very different structure. Um, also truffles, if you've ever had truffle oil something, or you know, some gone to some fancy meal and they grate truffles on your food, that's uh, a, a, a Ascomycota. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the fungus that produces penicillin is in the Ascomycota, and yeast are in the Ascomycota. So yeast are generally unicellular. And I just want to talk a little bit more about yeast because humans have a very, very long association with yeast. 
Yeast is a unicellular ascomycota. We're playing with yeast in lab. And most yeasts reproduce asexually through budding, although yeast can have sex as well. Um, and the big thing that yeast does is that it ferments carbohydrates. So um, they break down glucose and they produce, produce ethanol and CO2. Particularly, they do that particularly when there's no oxygen. So yeast have been used by humans for thousands of years to make beer and wine. Um, we also use it in bread to make the bread rise. So next time you're having a beer and eating a sandwich, thank a fungus. See you guys next time.